Some theorems have the form, if premise 1 and premise 2 and in so on, and premise n, then conclusion. A direct way of proving such theorems is to assume that all premises hold true and establish on this basis that the conclusion is true. For example, let's prove that the sum of two odd integers is even. Let M and N be odd integers. If M is odd, what does that mean? It means that M is of the form 2 times an integer plus 1. So M equals 2 times k1 plus 1, where k1 is some integer. Similarly, n being odd means that n equals 2 times some integer k2 plus 1. We want their sum. We want to find out what their sum is. So let's add them up. m plus n is 2k1 plus 2k2 plus 1 plus 1, which is 2. Notice that we can factor our a2 and we're left with 2 times k1 plus k2 plus 1, which is even. Sometimes this direct proof approach is difficult to execute. An instance of this is the theorem. If p is a prime integer, then the square root of p is irrational. So, is there an alternative way of proving a theorem of the form if premise 1 and premise 2 and so on in premise n, then conclusion? Yes, we can write a proof by contradiction. In a proof by contradiction, we assume that all premises hold true, but that the conclusion is false. We then proceed to derive a contradiction to an established fact or premise. Once such a contradiction is reached, we are forced to reject the possibility that the conclusion is false. So we accept it as true. We're going to illustrate this method of proof by contradiction by this example right here. We're going to prove that if p is a prime integer, then the square root of p is irrational. 
So let's begin. Let's assume all of our premises hold true, but that the conclusion is false. So assume that assume that p is a prime integer. So assume p is prime, but that square root of p is not irrational. But that the square root of p is not irrational. That is the same as it being rational. So what does that mean? What does it mean for square root of p to be rational? It means that the square root of p can be expressed as the ratio of two integers. D not equal to zero. Now, without, without loss of generality, we can assume that this fraction in over d has been reduced. So, without loss of generality, let's take or assume that n over d is reduced. It is a fact that if n over d is reduced, then their greatest common divisor must be 1. So assume that the greatest common divisor of n in d is 1. Let's pay attention to the equation itself. Let's manipulate it. Let's get rid of that square root by squaring both sides of the equation. So square both sides. The left hand side becomes p. The right hand side becomes n squared over d squared. So if you cross multiply, this will give that the d squared equals P times D squared equals N squared. If you cross multiply, you get P times D squared equals N squared. Now, remember, P is a prime integer, meaning it is, say, greater than 1. So, P is prime greater than 1. There is a fact in number theory that says if N squared is a multiple of a prime p, then p divides n squared. p divides n squared. That's an abbreviation of divides. Another fact of number theory it says, if a prime divides the square of an integer, then it divides the integer itself. So p divides n squared leads to p dividing n. If p divides n, then you can express n as p times some other integer. So n can be expressed as p times k so let's do this now let's go back to our equation p d squared equals n squared and replace n by p k so what do we get then we get p times d squared equals to p k squared Develop pk squared. What is that? That's the same as 
p squared times k squared. Notice that on both sides of that equation, we can cancel out a p. What's left? What's left is that d squared equals to p times k squared. Now we have this situation that uh, p, which is prime, is a factor of d squared. So that means it divides d squared. So p divides d squared. Now, since p is prime, and it divides the square of an integer, it must divide the integer itself. So that means that p divides d. Let's frame this conclusion we reached here and go back to an earlier conclusion where we had that p divides n. So you have an integer p, which is greater than 1, that divides both n and d. What does that tell? If p divides n and p divides d, then this tells that the greatest common divisor of n and d must be greater than 1. It's going to be greater or equal to p, which is greater than 1. Because p divides both, it is possible that p is the greatest common divisor. Or that the greatest common divisor is larger than p. Either way, our conclusion is that the greatest common divisor of n and d is greater than 1. This stands in contradiction to our initial hypothesis that their greatest common divisor was going to be 1. Little notation error here. The greatest common divisor of n and d equals 1. So this contradicts that. This stands in contradiction to our hypothesis that the greatest common divisor of n and d was 1. Okay, so we have reached that contradiction to an established fact or premise. So then we go back and reject the possibility that the square root of p is rational. So we reject the possibility that square of p is rational. So square of p must be irrational. That's all.